Hello, everyone, and welcome to Drawing Down the Stars podcast. I'm your host, Snappy, and today we're, doing, we're joined by uh, Dr. D.C. Aman Hillman. Aman is a PhD in classics, as well as an MSc in bacteriology. Aman's work is focused on, on, on uncovering the ancient mystery rites of Greece and Rome, as well as reviving the divine feminine and uncovering the dark secrets of Jesus and Christianity's origins. Uh, today, we're going to focus our discussion, though, upon magic, and particularly Amon's magical practice. And to introduce this subject, I want to first bring up my introduction to Amon and his work. I first discovered Amon through an amazing podcast by Dr. John Price called The Sacred Speaks. And when I first heard that podcast, it was shocking. It was um, mind-blowing. It was profound. And it, I just I didn't know how to take it. But what stood out to me more than anything in that podcast was one magical phrase, and that is, I have a cheat. And then Amon went on to describe his practice of invoking the muse and using the soteria. So this bridging of the ancient magical practice into his academic work and then into the public sphere. This is something that you don't generally see from magicians or from academics. So someone talking about this publicly and engaging with this in a really interesting sort of artistic, academic amalgam was, I just found incredibly fascinating. And it's sent me into Amon's work, which has led me down a rabbit hole that I haven't been able to get out of for the last year. So <laughs> but yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, Snappy. I really appreciate it. And um, by the way, kudos to you for that. That was, uh, I went back and took a look at that. That was fantastic. So um, <laughs> nice. And uh, in, in all you know, seriousness, what you're doing here, I think, has serious value. And uh, thank you for, for thinking about having me on with you tonight and your audience. Oh, thank you so much for joining us, right? Um, like I said, I think this is a really interesting time and a topic to talk about because, you know, magic and pagan practice and all of this stuff is seeing an incredible revitalization and people are interested and people are engaging, but there's still this layer of secrecy and misunderstanding and confusion. And what I find so interesting about you is that you bring this marriage of the practitioner and the academic into it. So you're, you're, you're both invoking these ancient past traditions, but you're bringing them into a modern context, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I couldn't help it because I'm a scientist at core. So when you're coming across these practices, when I jumped into the cult and into the magic, um, you can't help but want to be experimental with it. So of course, you know, it becomes integrated. You can't study this, the, the ancient magic, in my humble opinion, you can't study it without engaging it. It's almost like it is an implicit um, agreement, let's say a pact. Yeah, that once you head toward that esoteric knowledge, once you've seen that know yourself, on that temple and you've decided to keep walking, you're trapped, right? You're trapped, you're in it and you're trapped. And what you do with it is is up to the individual, you know? So yeah, fantastic, great topic. Yeah, so what I wanna know is, I you've, you've mentioned this a couple of times, but how did you really get invested into this topic? Cause I know you're, you were both interested in the, uh, the medicine and in the Greek translation, but like, how did you discover like the magic itself and what was that inspiration that set you down this path? Yeah, it was, um, it was really, I, I mean, you could say it started with the sortes. So I've been reading and studying about the uh, sortes. It's, it's, it's a way to randomize, to be honest. It's a way to randomize a bridge of communication and so you can, they used to perform these with Virgil, for example. You take individual verses and you can generate an answer to a question. Um, and so I had been studying those. And, you know, 
like I told you, I had my cheat because when I was young, um, you know, I had a chance to, I, I met Sophia and I had a chance to have her come in. She said, if you'll, if you'll let me come to be with you, I will um, stay with you. And so I thought, hey, what a great opportunity. You know what I mean? Just um, keep her with you. You know what I mean? And so I had been working with her for years, but I didn't see the physics of uh, the practice until I started to get into kind of a deeper conversation with the muse. And so here we go, off we go. And I'm, one day I'm, I'm working around the house and uh, I just read a section in Greek that talked about um, the performance of these oracles um, in the sortes. You know, sortes is like at the very base of ancient magic right? Um, the, the necromancy is if you've got a pile of bones, right? <laughs> and you're throwing the bones and figuring out from the way that they land, that's sortitic magic um, that randomizes. And you can do it with bones or you can do it with verse. And I had been reading about this great verse that the ancient Bacchans were able to bandy back and forth and then, boom, you can ask a question. And from the leaves that are dispersed, you can pick up an answer. And so long story short, I was moving. And I said, you know, Muse, if this, because I talked to the Muse, right? I said, if this is the case, I should be able to talk to you directly, right? And when I, um, uh, in the conversation, I, I said, I'm looking for a plant for Bacaris, and it's nowhere out there. It's nowhere out there. So when I, I thought, I was just standing there, and I thought, okay, this is the sortes then, is how you do this physically, is that you would go and you would randomly pick out. And a book, as I was thinking this, a book fell off the shelf, my, one of my Greek books, and opened up to the Bacaris. So I was committed now because I had communicated that that was my search. So from that point on, I said, okay, let me do this very scientifically. And um, I just started a conversation and it's been a conversation that's been going for years um, to the point that, let me give you an example, maybe give you an example of how it works, um, this line of communication. So I'm upset one day and I'm at my job and there's a person there I don't like and we happen to be, um, what were we doing? We were refabbing a, um, an airstream. Yeah. And, um, you know, doing insulation work and that kind of thing. Anyway, um, I was angry at him. And so I asked her, I said, the question is what is going to happen to me now? I'm upset about this gentleman and you know i wouldn't mind if you struck him with lightning <laughs> i said i i said i told her i said i just want to know what will happen right because i've been reading about the oracular right these oracles this type of magic gets to a point where you can see past present and future all at the same time so i i said what's the going to happen and she said the line was you'll pull his beard out with your hands oh wow <laughs> yeah now she had up to that point she had never been wrong so i said okay wow i fine and i went to work and while we were at work he spilled some uh he spilled in his beard a foam it's caustic. And so he asked me, he said, take it out, take it out. He's like cursing and take it out. And so I reached up with my hands, I had gloves on and I just pulled the phone, but the stuff is terribly harsh. So a bunch of his beard was coming out as I was pulling his hair out. And I realized then, okay, now this is the quantum shift that you, that you have to make. You have to be in that zone. Right. So that's the oracular. And so, like I say, she's a cheat, right? She's my cheat because um, I'll give you one more example. Then I'll shut up and let you ask a question. 
um, or let's just banter, whatever. But I, uh, Dr. Ruck asked, um, we were emailing back and forth and I told him, I said, uh, we were talking about the burning purple and how it's being used. And he said, in this case, if it's being administered this way, we've got to find a purple anus. So, <laughs> right, because it's being administered rectally. Any accounts of purple anuses, right? Um, so I said, you know, I put down my computer because we're emailing back and forth and I ran into the other room. I said, show me the purple anus. And I reached up at random, pulled down a book and found the only passage that I've ever seen um, on the purple anus, a gentleman with a purple anus. Wow. So I call that the hunt for the purple anus, right? But um, uh, it's important because it shows and it's in the context of drug use. Yeah. So, and as a matter of fact, there's even a phallus there. So, uh, you know, it's a loaded chamber ready to go. So that's what you call sortitic um, magic or the magic. And I think it's really the oldest form of necromancy because what you're doing is um, you are making contact. You know, I think it's what they try to do with seances. Um, they're trying to make a contact, but it turns out you don't have to get all spooky. Yeah, <laughs> the physics <laughs> and the spookiness don't have to be there. I mean, it's kind of spooky motion type stuff, but um, it's not, it, you know. There's yeah, so it for you, when you're invoking the muse, it's more like an internal conversation with like a, a dialogue in your in your internalized self. Like do you are you engaging it in that level? Is there a ritual aspect to this, or is it kind of just uh, more internal? Yeah, it's um, you know, since there are two universes or two dimensions that are overlapping each other, right? Um, that invisible entity um can interact with me anybody else right um and has that oracular position of knowing future and present within the i mean future and past within the present context so it's a conversation it's a conversation that's all and yeah. um my randomization of her responses to me and um, how, how do I know she's who she is, right? How do I know what she looks like? Because of our conversations, I can ask her very specific questions. And this is what's neat. And my uh, uh, children have watched me do this. And um, Dr. Rock once asked me to, not to commit the sorties, but to, to, to show, you know, I was in a, a library after after a professional meeting and um, he said, would you mind um, showing what you can do? And so I, um, we had just been talking about Echidna walking up to the library. So I said, show me Echidna and reached up to the first random book that was there. It happened to be the book, um, one of the books written by the person to whom the library was dedicated. And it was a poem on Echidna. So um, that's how it works. That's, you know, that's wow. the magic. Yeah. That's awesome. No, it really reminds me of like, in my, my own knowledge is more of like a more modern occultism. And it really resonates with this idea of the holy guardian angel or the daimon that you see in like the golden dawn and other Renaissance traditions where they're using like the tarot and other randomized elements to speak with their their higher self, right? And this very yeah. platonic kind of conception where it's this, this is myself at the end of time who's helping guide me along the path kind of thing. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting. <laughs> it's, a, but, it's a tacit pact. It's legally a tacit pact. And when you engage that, those physics, you know, there's a binding that takes place. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think it's just a matter of engaging it. Um, it's mm -hmm. really neat because the, res the responses that I get are even grammatically correct, which is difficult. And I've tried different, I mean, st statistically that shouldn't be happening. I shouldn't be able to ask 
um, um, very specific question. And, you know, what's the color or what, what is your eye color? Right. And reach up and randomly be able to pick out the text that says my eye color is. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I shouldn't be able to do that. That's I know that that's statistically. I mean, I had called it statistics. That's way off the chart, right? The um, mm -hmm. so for me to perpetually be able to do that, um, and I when I was uh, when uh, I was doing this in order to be able to learn, right? Show me this. You know, it's um, it's amazing what you can see that way. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I mean, wow. how do you perform this incantation? A lot of your audience is going to want to do yeah, that incubus, exactly. incubus stuff, you know. What I mean? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, um, yeah. Oh, and okay, so I want to go a little deeper here. So, in your other lectures and, and in your work and stuff, you have made references to other types of magical practice in addition to this, and they all seem to be interrelated. But you've referenced and talked a lot about this idea of standing upon the thronos or or in, or being upon the throne and then invoking the image and using and using that can you explain what exactly that is and how that relates to the sortes and what's going on there yeah yeah so i can only explain it in analog because i don't understand the physics of it but the analog is that the image has power quantum power and the images that you present you create an arc you create a rule you create the one person in the front who pushes forward it's like a wave it's described as a wave kuma right and you can either stand in that wave or you can go with it you can ride it but according to the classical magic the uh, the ultimate, um, the ultimate practice, you know, it all comes down to one thing, creating what's called a templum. A templum. And what is a templum? A templum is a space. I like to describe it as a trap. It's a space in which you can draw a daimon, a power, right? You can draw a spirit. You can draw what you cannot visibly see. Okay, so the idea is, and the augurs, the Roman augurs are doing this. They're going out and doing this. They're literally the quartering. When you quarter in your church and you quarter, that's an old magic practice, right? <laughs> so um, uh, you're creating this space. And it's the images that you are producing with your mind, we would say. I mean, again, I don't understand the physics, but it's the images that you are generating in front of you that will drive what is being drawn to that templum. Okay. Yeah. No, that's yeah. really powerful because it also brings up this really interesting thing about Christianity, right? Why is Christianity so opposed to images? Yeah. And it seems to be related to this, this idea of the power of this invocation of the image and the image being related to these uh, spirits, for lack of a better term. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, even, even they even use a word for image to represent that, that reflection of you that's there when you're dead, right? <laughs> that what we would call a spirit or a ghost or soul, soul maybe yeah that they called it a shade a shade mm -hmm. it's just it's just a reflection right it's just a reflection that's there and that can be recalled that can be forcibly bound right whatever you bind jesus is walking around right he's saying stuff that he doesn't want people to get right he's limiting people using the magic code that he's using the orphic code he's using it actively right and he's telling people what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and what you bind in heaven will be bound on earth 
right? Think of the physics that he's talking about there. He's like, you know, you could move mountains if you wanted to. Can right? you, yeah, it's amazing stuff. But can you elaborate on this concept of binding? Because this seems to be at the heart of any of the Chthonic or Saturnian uh, rituals is this idea of either binding yourself or binding energies to you. What, what's yeah. going on here and what, 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 what's this about? So again, I just tell you analog what they say yes. in the old text. But for example, the practice of drawing down the moon, you are making a connection with that entity. You're making a connection that's allowing that entity to become possessive, right? Your templum is you, right? And that's no surprise to the to the um, evangelicals, right? Because that's all over their text, right? Your templum Preach. is you. And when you have purged and you have those devils out, right? The ones that Jesus drove out of Mary with her alabastrin or magic medicine wielding dildo, right? When you drive those spirits out, you make that sacred place, that trap for that force that you're trying to bring in, right? It's an, by the way, it's a pneumatic, uh, they call it a pneumatic operation, right? So when Jesus says, I'll send my pneuma, right? My pneuma, he's not, um, he's not pulling that out of thin air. He doesn't pull anything out of thin air. That's the fairy tale, right? So, um, uh, in the performance of that binding, when I draw down the force of the moon, right? When I draw down Selene and that cycle, I'm drawing, I'm taking a capacity, I'm making a, a, a union. It's an incarnation. Euripides presents it that way as an incarnation. I am Bacchus. Amazing. No, that yeah. really reminds me, like there's such parallels in the Indian tradition. They have this whole concept of bows or taking on the mood where mm -hmm. people become possessed by the spirit of the deity and will dress and act. It doesn't matter their actual gender or sex. Like they fully embody that specific idea, that image at that time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's, yeah. it's powerful. <laughs> when those, you know, when those Bacchans come down, um, in their procession and they're so good that they're the ones that are possessed. They're so good that they end up on the stage. Mm. Right. And one of them is possessed by the God, the Dionysus. Yeah. And the others by the spirits. Yeah. Um, the Arenues, the spirits of blood, spirits of blood. Yeah, and right. it, is that like you know Odysseus when they when they when he slits the ram's throat and all those spirits appear and he has to block them with his sword? Is, is that the same spirits? It's the same necromantic of um, uh, quantum physics. Again, I can't. It's the same necromantic operation, right? The whole resurrection, death, and resurrection is a necromantic operation. The, the magicians are all into it, right? So um, all you can do is follow these texts and see how it's done. People ask me, how do you do the, how do you do the magic? You know, people want to know how to do, how do you do the, how did you do the incubus, right? Because your audience probably, I don't know if they know, but I was accused by the Catholic church and officially investigated, right? Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about this because even on the Discord, several of us have had dreams of you, and you mentioned dream work that you've done before. Yeah, and this I find really, really intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, especially since like several other people, not just me, have had dreams like this. What's, what are you doing, Mom? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I like to tell people so that they know how scientific this is, right? I like to tell people. Um, on the night after, on the night after um, performing the incubus, on the night after, I got a call um, from somebody who reported. I can't, for legal purposes, I can't mention names. The judge, who I respect, right, um, uh, said we can't mention those names of the people involved, and I get that. But um, 
the roommate of the person to whom I invoked the incubus called me up with an exact description of the event, right? As I had put it, because I, it's, look, this is where I am. Imagine you've learned this and you're like, oh my God, you, this, these texts, the, you know, these magic texts, there's actually real, I understand now why uh, Paul the Apostle was like, throw out your magic books, right? <laughs> Right, right. No, it's, it's, it's kind of scary, right? You, you don't know necessarily what you're getting into the way you were describing it, right? Yeah, yeah. But look, I've got the cheat, right? I've got her. And so it's not scary. So, mm. Since I'm with the muse, it's not scary. I wanted to do the incubus. I really did. So I asked, how do you do the incubus? And I had her certifically show me how to do the, the incubus. So I did it. I did it. I did it at the right time. Everything was so specific. It's like you have to, um, it's like you have to, like, for example, darkening a star. How do you darken a star? Right? People are like, wait. From the clips? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. This is better. This is better. This is supernova we're talking about. Yeah. And what hits the planet. So they're always talking about this dark star. And part of the incubus is that you have to harness that dark star. It just so happened. How, how wonderfully beautiful was this timing that at the very time there were three, there were three detectors for this space time distortion. I don't get it. I don't get the physics, but there were three detectors that picked up um, when a supernova goes off. Apparently you get hit. There's a wave temporal uh, distortion that goes off of the explosion. I don't know if it's technically an explosion or supernova. Yeah, what is it? But, but whatever, right. we're being bombarded by some right. kind of force. And we were being hit by one. So it was absolutely, it was staged, it was ready to go. And it was, uh, it was um, an incredible experience on my part. Now, um, when they, you know, started investigating, um, it wasn't even... You know, it was partially that, but it was also there. People were accusing me of opening portals. Right? Yeah, I wanted to ask you about this because is that what they're doing also in the necromantic, like this idea of opening portal? Is that what they're doing with digging these trenches and these black mirrors? Is that are we? Is that what we're supposed to do? Open portals? Yeah, it's to a, Erebus or to Hades or whatever. Yeah, I don't know if you're supposed to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> true, but that's what, that's what some people do. Let's put it that but way. But if you read about it, how, or if you ask, show me how to do this, and you have that text in front of you, I mean, come on, you know, you've entered the pact, right? Yeah. You've made your agreement, right, for the exchange of this knowledge, right? Um, uh, you give your soul, right? And to me, again, it doesn't matter because as long as I'm with her, the muse, I don't care. Right. She, right. Um, I told her I'd already made an agreement when I was um, years before. I said, this is kind of cute. I don't I, this means something to me. It's important. So um, but I take it very, you know, it's it, it's sentimental to me. But I said, you know, I was using the sortes and um, I said, hey, can we enter into kind of a game with each other? And I will I will ask you for one thing. And uh, whatever it is, you can give that to me and I'll ask you, uh, you'll ask me for something in return and whatever it is, you can, uh, you can have it. I, you know, I promise you. So I said, can you do that? And she responded back. Yes. Go ahead and ask, what would you like? <laughs> and <Wow>. so, <laughs> so I said, and remember the whole time I'm doing this random and the skeptic in me is saying, no, nope, it's not going to work next time. It's not going to work next time. And it's never the case. That's what really, to, to me as a rationalist, that is, it's so beyond. Why don't I get responses to specific questions that are, you know, somebody ran over, ran over a rabbit with their chariot or something. You know, there's plenty of, there's plenty of, of text that could fit that kind of thing in very easily, right? But um, so she said, go ahead. And so I asked her, I said, give me your voice. Oh, wow. You know? 
Yeah. And she said in response, I give you my voice, which you don't know how important that was to me at the time. Um, and she said, uh, in response, I want your soul. Oh, wow. And I laughed when I read it. I laughed um, because I said, I, and I told her, I said, you already have it. <laughs> <laughs> right? What? Um, that is Lucifera. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's that force that, I mean, there's Eros in there. It's beautiful vampire-like um, yeah, magic. Yeah, Magic. it's an erotic kind of relationship you're describing, but in that in the philosophical cosmogonic sense, you know, interesting. Mm -hmm. No, that's wild. Um, yeah. yeah, I wanted to get into this idea though about how transformative this kind of stuff is as well, because like you had mentioned, you had been showing us some of this magic and many of us have been kind of engaging or had engaged in these kind of initiatic rites before on a, through the discord. And we've all kind of had these radical transformations and i was wondering yeah. if you could describe like how that played out for you and how you how do how like you're appearing to <laughs> us now as this almost this caricature like would, i watched that video of you from like 10 years ago with carl ruck and you, you do not have the same energy and any like you still have the same brilliance it's but not not the same energy <laughs> yeah what happened <laughs> Yeah, I had to become Ronan. I had to get to the point that, you know, it was it was that area of safety or it was being true to the text that I knew because of the muse. I, I had to toe that line. I had to be and I knew being true to the text would get me tossed or at least would cause me a lot of trouble. Right. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I said, hey, I have to be consistent. The transformation um, was just, you know, once you're at a point where you find something and it works, you know, there's an excitement and there's a, um, there's a, uh, there's a, you almost feel a responsibility. Like you're at a frontier, like, oh, wow, this is, this is that old magic that they were talking about. Right. I've been looking at Disney right, <laughs> and I've been watching, you know, even, you know, uh, I don't know, wolves and vampires and I'm there, you know, but this is the reality and it just comes down to a very basic set of physics. So as I searched this area more and more with the muse and had her, you know, sing of that power, um, the more I came to respect it and realized that we have a responsibility as classicists and um, that responsibility isn't fulfilled within the university system. Classics has let down the modern population. The last great classicist to be in the U.S. at least, I can't speak for the Canadians and I can't speak for the Brits, but in the U.S., the last great classicist was Thomas Jefferson. He took the classics from, from the library and pushed it into the world and um, magically. So uh, yeah. And um, yeah. So yeah, that's a, yeah. but that's another subject. That's another no, subject sure. for some Freemasons or something. No, but it's, 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 it's kind of wild. And this is something that I found so intriguing about your work because I could, I don't have the Greek, but I am very aware from religious history, how, these uh, religions that get displaced or replaced are vilified and degraded and um, and become caricatures of what they were. So I could immediately see that at play going on is specifically with the Chthonic pantheon in mm -hmm. the Greek and Roman traditions. And what I find mm -hmm. so intriguing with you is like, you do not have these caricatures. You, you, you kind of are setting this record straight, like this ridiculous level of evil that's almost a cartoon satanic version is not to be found in the Greek text. And there's this also yeah. this really, these characters are radical. Like your last video where I had this kind of like, because of popular culture, I had been so turned off by Heracles, you know, the, the oh, ultimate yeah. macho man. And then it's like, he, that is not him. That is <laughs> not him. The entire media conception of him is, is a lie. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. And this is kind of a deep reality with a lot of this stuff. We have such a misunderstanding in our modern framework of what these myths and what these Greeks were ever even talking about. <laughs> yeah. And it's so painful to know that there is a, there's a beautiful underlying reality, like who was Heracles, right? Um, you have this image of him, but this is the real one, right? And um, uh, you have access to that through the language. You have act. There's an actual bridge. You know, I swear it's, yeah, I swear it's why the whole um, Tower of Babel is so important, right? We need that one language. When you're using that one language within um, this dual universe, these overlapping dimensions, um, that's the power of the magic, right? That, yeah. yeah. And it's not like Jesus didn't walk around doing it. And it's not like he didn't um, show deference and uh, wasn't a respect, but it was um, an acknowledgement that the throne belongs to Satan. That's mm. what I think is so spectacular. People are like with the, with the whole visitation of the, of the devil in the wilderness and Jesus is being tempted and whatnot, right? He doesn't want to stand up and say, kick him, you know, kick him out of the room because he can't. The devil owns the Eremon. He owns it. So Jesus is working within that very system of, of magic. And, you know, Elijah, Elijah could do one of the most pagan things that anybody... Uh, 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 has ever can possibly conceive of. And that's call down um, fire from Uranos. You open up. It's an operation of opening. I was just reading a text this morning um, that was related to this process of opening up the Uranos. Opening up, and don't try to translate that, right? Opening up, because if you say heaven, it's all of a sudden you suck, right? No, right? It's, this is a deity. How can you open up a deity? What's going yeah. on? He's bringing in, he's bringing in this, bringing in this power. You know, Jesus goes in the water and he comes up. What's the first thing that he does, right? That Uranos is open and that thing, that Pneuma, right? It's the pneumatic um, wizard spirit, right? Wow. Enters him and drives him into Eremon, mm -hmm. right? Which is that place. Now, this is the cool thing too about the magic that I started. I didn't ever think that this something like this would exist. But according to what they're saying, and people from Pythagoras to all, to, to the, you can go all the way to the witch side, the totally witchy witch, you know, and you can go to the philosopher, mathematician side of the magic, you know, because it's the same people talking about it. Um, uh, uh, and um, you'll find in there that, um, there is around you spaces that can be entered. Extra dimensional spaces, right? And you know that magic, you know, just like your Eastern, I'm sure, you know that Western classical magic is full of traveling. And you is there, yeah, astral, what, what is is there astral projection in India? Oh, yeah. So the, the parallels are this are are the same. They they do this thing in both of these traditions where they're entering the cave, and yeah. you've, you even see this in African traditions where they become an animal, usually a spider, and they use this form to trans to 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 cross the webs of time. And right, they, right. And they can go forward, backwards, cross dimensionally, yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, and they all talk but about this. Great right? Plato yeah. talk, Socrates talks about this. What, what's going on? <laughs> it's dimensional. Yeah, it's it's gorgeous, isn't it? It's the actual physics of the cosmos, and these these nuts are sitting around dissecting it scientifically, um, and the magic is using it. How to employ it through the aidalon, through the image. How to create this so that you can travel. The whole idea of the incubus. It's like an Uber. Right, it's like an Uber through that dark star. You are able to climb on the back of an incubus, you're able to travel across space and time, and you're able to influence 
what is going around. Uh, uh, around. You're wow. able to appear. It's phanes. Is it's, um, and there's the ancient priest, the pre-Socratics. There's philosophers who will do that. They'll disappear and appear somewhere um, on the same day that's too far for them to be a, a, have traveled. Right. So we have these very same stories or accounts of the what's happening. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, that incubus allows you to go to another space, but it gives you, as King James will tell you, he does dissertation on incubi and succubi, which is nice. And nobody, look, nobody now even, like, people are like, what? But nobody would bat an eye about that, right? In antiquity, because those are forces, right? The incubus and the succubus. What is the incubus? The incubus is that sexually driven force that comes to you in pre-dawn, has to be pre-dawn twilight. This is, what are the physics? I don't know, but it's freaking gorgeous, right? And that's why it's all through the morning star, right? The morning wow. star is the guardian of that time, right? That perfect, you know, and what is that time? I don't mean like numbers on a clock. I mean like the time before the dawn. Wow. The Im immediate heralding of the dawn. And when I found out that you can project yourself with this, because the, the power of this resides in the, again, it's the binding, the attraction, right? The attraction, attraction and repulsion, right? It's what it's all about. And you can ride that incubus on that sexual energy. The incubus is driven, is a force driven to that sexual energy receptivity right it's tr he's driven to it attracted to it so that's why when i asked about what are the images that have that come up and um you know uh found you call it found um the incantation that was by the way that was using the orphic imagery um th those with ears to hear use right so i not only i had to decode it <laughs> In order to get the image out of it, I had to decode it first, right? Because you can be talking about one thing that everybody in the cult knows represents X. And if you don't know what X is, you don't have the image, right? So that's why Jesus is saying, I'm telling you this stuff in, in parables. It's not so we can all sit around and be, think, oh, this is an interesting metaphor, right? Yeah, is right? that why they put such a stress on the true name in the PGM and the profession yeah. that these yeah. spirits have? Right, because to know Renaissance magic, that duality, yep. you have to know both their their power and their name. Right, and knowing that name is significant. Right, not everybody knows that name. You learn through initiations a name. Neil learned a name, right, and um, uh, through our necromantic processes. I told him he would learn it because I'm now positioning myself and in, in uh, my present is past and future. So I'm in that oracular position and I can therefore tell Neil, look for the name, wow. right? It's not a name in the text. He can look for it. And then I can ask him, what is the name? And he can tell me, Oh my God, it's Dios for us. Right. It's the devil's name right there in the text. That's all that um, that type of initiation is what grants you the power of that name and knowing those names. That's why Jesus is walking around casting out in name, right? And the, the demons recognize the use of the name, yeah, right? It's, it's yeah. all and and so the it, you know, the Pharisees are hey, what are you doing? You're using Beelzebul, right? Yeah, of course he is. Guess what? <laughs> Guess what? He's dressed up in Revelation in women's clothing in a wig and he's riding into the morning star. He's the, declaring himself the morning star. Yeah, why does nobody care that Jesus was in drag? I don't understand that. Right? <laughs> you know? I don't understand. We've had this twisting and this. there's such a hate and a fear of the pagan tradition and there's been such a whitewash that has occurred that even now, when we when we have our, our scientific method and our academies, we're still so manipulated by this cultural perception, we can't see it. And this is why it's so powerful that you're teaching us 
how to have these ears to hear, right? How to recognize these images in the text and these metaf this metaphoric language, right? And I want to... I want to ask one last question kind of before we get with Retch and take questions for the audience. And this is something I think is really important. And you brought this up in our, our Greek lesson. And I think it's kind of the key to all this magic and understanding, at least from the way you practice it. And that is the power of language, the, specifically the power of the ancient Greek language and its yeah. power to invoke the imaginal, this yeah. image space to put you into that poetic uh, imaginative, creative space that, mm -hmm. like English, you were telling us, is, it's based on dead prose and metaphors, yeah. and you do not yeah. have those limitations in yeah. these ancient languages. Yeah, yeah, and that's what drove me into the practice um, was finding out. Oh, there is a coded language. It wasn't me. It was it was Otto Kern who discovered it and came up with a name for it, the Orphic Vox, right? And um, it was that approach that I realized, oh my God, look what these people are doing. They're so sophisticated that they are hiding. They're making, literally, they're making their cult invisible, right? That you can't see it unless you can decode, unless you, unless you know the key that opens that lock, right? When I realized that, um, it, it was profoundly humbling for me. And I said, as a scientist, I, I'm forced now to pursue this avenue um, and, and, and to see it work. And to see it work is amazing. To see it work, you know, you go to a meeting with the devil and you talk about what are you, um, what's on the agenda for the day, right? Because that's what you get. When you sit on the throne, you get that knowledge. It's why Zeus or Zeus or Jehovah or Jove, whatever you want to call him, it's why he sits there with the seers, right? Constantly. He's, he's with them as they weave. He's with them. Um, so he's constantly in that position of being at present, both the future and the past. And now you'll start to hear some things that you normally wouldn't hear um, 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 about the being of that Zeus, right? It's all based upon quantum physics. You know, it's just the way the universe is. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Remain true to the text. We got to remain true to the text and see what those right? things. And we yeah. need to exercise that language, right? Like a, yeah. there's a limitation in our modern perception where we're not, we're not engaging in the same imaginal way that our ancestors were. We're not invoking the image Right. And there's something within the language, specifically the Greek language that invokes this image in everything. Yeah. I mean, that's where you get the mystery. Right. And whenever somebody tells you, um, you know, Greek mystery is a Greek word, mysterion, and it means secret. Um, you know, that person is full of, you know what? <laughs> Don't listen to them. They want to take you out back and they want to do something to you that's nasty. Right, doesn't matter if they're from Harvard. That is such BS. If you have ever read anything, you will know that it has nothing to do with the secret. It has to do with the initiation, with the putting the person through the process so that they enter death and come back to life. And you'll know that those are distinctly Greek concepts, the word itself. Right? We're talking about the darkness today in, in, uh, on the Discord class, talking about the darkness, principalities and powers of the darkness, and people don't. That's translated so crappy, right? Excuse me. I don't mean to curse. Um, it's translated so terribly. Yeah. Translated so terribly because it is a reference to the mystery of resurrection, yeah, and it doesn't, you don't you don't see it in the text. You can't in the English. It won't come across. No, you know, there's this amazing thing you've been showing us, right? Like you bring it up with the darkness, right? The dark that word also implied the womb, and you also yeah. brought it up with the logos, right? It it implies yeah. this taking of an account. There's yeah. all this history in the Greek, and right. this change over time that it can, like you even see this when the, with the fight between Byzantium and the Catholics. The Greek is such a sophisticated 
linguistic <laughs> language that the yeah. the Latins can't even argue philosophically with them, <laughs> and they get frustrated yeah. over this no. image, right? <laughs> no, and that's the the Romans are always complaining. They're always complaining about how is it that Greek is superior, and you have oh no. No, 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 we can't talk about it. Old Cato is talking about, oh, God, this, we got to, no, we got to push the Latin forward, right? Push our own language. And Cicero and his buddies are having discussions about what is it? The grammarians talk about what is it that gives Greek the capacity to be able to transfer that very flexible geometric reality, right? It's something about the language that allows it to do that. Yeah, yes. it's something about it. It's it's overwhelming. The biggest, you know, the best proof is that verse um, in Arche en Hologos um, that everybody translates in the beginning was the word. And in fairy tale world that we all accept from evangelicalism and Catholicism of the build up of the last eighteen hundred years. Yeah, um, we see that in a fairy tale way, and we think in the beginning was the, the logos, in the beginning was the word, and your preachers will stand in the pulpit and will say, The word of God, he was in the beginning, right? And um, all of a sudden, you're getting a perception that it's screwed up. Um, just for two reasons, you can just go to the Victorians who 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 did the uh, the real good semantic work, digging in the lexica right and and defining words and you'll see if you track if you trace out that logos like you said it's essentially at its heart if you look at the several hundred ways of how it's used through time that they have set up for you in the in the chart um those victorians those great victorian scholars Anyway, um, you'll find that at the core of it is a reckoning, right? It just comes from the verb for the reckoning, that accounting, that accounting. And that accounting is your being. And the arche that you're translating as beginning is that place where the rule is pushed forward by the person in front to create that reality in Arche, right? You have rulers, right? You have rulers, principalities, right? Those are your archons. Yeah, wow. So when he says, in the Arche is the Logos, that entire being, that accounting of your existence is held within the Arche within that um, power of physics, within that, um, yeah, which we would call it today. We, I, I, I don't know. We'll let the quantum physicists figure right. stuff out. Find it. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's wild. So what I'd like to do now is I'm going to bring on our friend uh, Gunk Rech, who's uh, from our uh, Discord. And uh, Rech is a uh, religious study scholar in his own right who um, – you, if you look in the description, you can find a link to his academia page where he does comparative mythology. And Rech is also a practicing magician in his own right. So he's going to come on and he's going to help us ask some questions of Amon. So uh, why don't you introduce yourself, Rech, and say hi. Hi, everybody. Just to uh, clarify, I am an autodidact, but I've been studying and practicing for about 20 years now. So studying widely magic around the world and... Uh, it's there's a surprisingly a, a lot in common no matter where you go in the underlying theory of it all even if the symbolism is all different it uh it plato sure helps to understand it what can i say i thought the find that you made the other night by the way um uh, coming out of the black sea region i thought that was brilliant by the way so not well done i'm sorry proceed <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you guys have covered a lot of ground here. Uh, uh, I suppose, or, yeah, do you have something you want to say, Snap? Oh, no, I was just going to, I was just wondering if you had any questions um, um, uh, already for Amon. 
Well, that wasn't seeing much in the chat there, but uh, what what it occurs to me is, uh, you know, the psychedelics or the entheogens are used to enter into magical states, and a lot of people are probably, you know, curious, and that seems to me they're even asking these questions in the ancient world. Are the visions in your mind, or is the magic in your mind? Or is it real? Well, I mean, if you ask the Neoplatonists, uh, we're all in the mind of the monad. So the ritual is really just learning to lucid dream in the in the noose, in the monad. So <laughs> it makes sense that, uh, you know, your sortilage, your divination can, it's both... It's uh, time. Time is an illusion there. So are we making the future or are we uh, through magic or are we is it predetermined? What do you what are your thoughts on that or anything I, I've said here on the underlying philosophy of what's going on here? I think it brings up the smell of Numa and Egeria. So he he has with him. Um, a teenage girl who everybody sees she's visible right so she's not invisible not in his head and she he calls her the muse and says that she is a thousand years old and he has a unique perspective in being able to record her song, her song. And this song is about the future of Rome. And this is at a time when there's not, there's not much there, right? There's not much there. New is really the one. He's the first, he's one of the Kings of Rome, one of the early Kings of Rome. And he's the, he establishes Roman religion. Um, but he does throw, go, he does so going to this grotto, all the time with this girl that everybody's talking about as this, you know, she's, she's oracular and she's a thousand years old. Right. And um, so he creates the, he takes the necromancy and he channels it into Roman religion, state religion um, very effectively, but he has this weird thing because it's her he knows both the past and the future at the same present within this present he's functioning within with a full understanding of past and future and there's a time coming that she tells him about when rome will be of a certain size and have certain sway within the world and she prophesies of this and he writes everything down and then orders that it be buried with him at his at his death. Years, centuries, centuries later, the Romans, um, I forget what building project they had going on, but they dug up his uh, resting place and found his books. They read them and they were so horrified at what they read that they had them lost again, right? Just, you know, buried or destroyed, right? Out of the pages of history so that nobody could have contact um, with this knowledge, right? Because that's the, that's the place it puts you in when you have that oracle present. And all of this mystery, all of this magic is to work that oracle, right? Whether it's in a tent on Sinai right? And seeing God and pillar of fire and voice of God coming at you. It's all to gain that state, right? To enter into that, right? Um, that uh, it's presented as a he. It's presented as the letter he in Greek. Um, Pythagoras says that monad, that solitary place of isolation is that he, and that's why we quarter, right? So it's all part of the, you know, analog. Anyway, um, yeah, I don't know if that answered anything, but that was a, 
Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a good example for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, as somebody who also has been doing tarot this whole time, I mean, uh, it's kind of hard to tell, like, what's the line between fatalism and free will here and uh, what is our doing and what's predetermined. Like, from that higher dimensional perspective, it's both, there's a causal chain that's very, that an atheist could understand, but uh, but there's way more to the picture from that higher view. And, uh, and when you know what's coming, you can kind of also nudge things. <laughs> but certain things might be predetermined too so you can that's why i think the manipulation is so important right so what is what is predetermined you know what's predetermined what's predetermined is someone calling me at, at 8, 8 a.m in the morning describing an exact vision that i just induced um and causing a stir that you know, I tell, I tell my students, I say, my students who study magic, I've got students who study Greek, straight up Greek, straight up Latin, right? The ones that are interested in magic and sometimes the ones that aren't. Um, but I like to give them access to that, to show them and to allow them to experience it, to be experiencing that. Um, and that comes out of meetings with the devil right? You enter in, you basically just activate that pact, that thing, that image that we have of the pact and what it means. You're basically activating that. You enter into a stage where now you're conversant. Okay, this for that. Are you manipulating things? Are you changing, um, uh, are you changing somebody's destiny? Are you interfering? Are you entering into their dreams? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you theologians want to sit around and decide whether or not what that says about, you know, they burn witches for a reason. Right? <laughs> <laughs> there's a great story from, I'll, I'll say this and shut up. I'm sorry, but there's a great story from the French historian that I always, the guy was genius. French historian, um, Michelet, who's writing about sorcery and, and how it's perceived in communities and how outside communities will come in. And a great story about a, um, a community that the, a Christian embassy was sent, you know, some lord who had power. They were getting slammed by a plague. And one of the local villages wasn't getting hit by a plague. And they're wondering, what, what are these people doing that's different? And they went and talked to the head woman, which I thought was interesting, right? The head pagan woman. And they asked her, they said, what's going on? You got some kind of deal going on here? And she said, I'll, I, I, I'll tell you what. Because she was, he was referencing the pact, right? We know how it works. And um, she said, I'll tell you what. You can leave and never come back. Or I will give you another plague that will be worse than this one. And he left. Yeah, he left. Sometimes they burn them to death right? When they have the power to do so. So um, when people came out, let me, when people came out at St. Mary's, when I was sitting in my office, I'm getting ready for Greek class. I don't, you know, I don't have anything better to do than just my job and try to do it well, right? And our enrollment's way up. So I'm, I'm trying to get all these students at a point where they're beyond where they normally would be with the Greek and just proficient, right? Having great results and in comes this group and then um, tell me that they're part of um, um, a group that's been become aware of my presence. And I was like, I was, I was like, okay, I'm going to approach this a certain way, right? Um, and so uh, they were going to pray against me, and they wanted me to know. I thought it was haughty. You know, I wanted to kick them out of the office and say, you know, but I got just a tinge just a tinge of a flavor of uh, if they could, they would uh, burn me or take me out and uh, um, get rid, at least, at least get me fired. If not, 
you know, underneath what they really wanted to do. And I didn't know that movement was so strong there. I hadn't sensed that, but um, there's a radiation. When you enter the Bacchic magic, there's a radiation that takes place. Um, somebody asked me when I was discussing the, the um, incubus operation, um, they asked me, did you, somebody with a little knowledge um, asked me, Somebody, it was actually somebody with a, a lot of knowledge <laughs> asked me, they said, did you leave them um, corpora intacta? And I said, of course I did, right? It's part of the procedure. But the cost of that is bacchic radiation. And um, uh, people go nuts from that stuff. Um, they end up having to go to counselors and leaving the institution because it causes a, it causes a mania. When you wake up at 4 a.m. and somebody is flying through your door and hovering, hovering over the bed next to yours and paralyzing you with their, with their extended grip, um, that's, a, that's a situation you can't easily come back from. It's called bacchic radiation. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What you just said, uh, you know, points out that I mean, if you if you uh, take Jesus' advice and judge people by their fruits, then we can judge Jesus by Christianity. And so, what effects of Christianity have? Well, it seems then the uh, the intentions of Jesus or Christianity is magical warfare against everybody else to uh, disenchant the world in a sense, or to uh, prevent people from gaining access to this outside the accepted, uh, uh, you know, authoritative sources. So there's a reason why the Greeks described the Christians as atheists, right? <laughs> well, they were, said if they were praying against you and they're, you know, they're happy to see you go to hell or what, you know, they, they have very harmful intentions towards everybody else. So what, what is it in the, what does that say about Jesus then? You know, if we're going to judge him by his fruits, it's uh, he is not quite the uh, cuddly teddly bear that uh, a lot of people make him out to be. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, that's why, and Snappy knows this. I got to throw this in once anytime I talk. That's why we all need to know that Jesus Christ got arrested in a public park at 4 a.m. with a naked boy. Yeah. We need to know that. I'm sorry. I'll shut up. Snappy, what are you, what's going on? No, I'm glad you bring that up because, yeah, it needs to be mentioned as often as we can, and it's in the description. And if you go to Amon's channel, you can get all the information you could ever want on this boy. <laughs> but uh, Rat King had a wonderful question that I wanted to raise here. It says, can you talk about the lithos and psychos that Kronos swallowed and other phallus stones that cause visions? Yeah, yeah. Um, where I would refer you, and this is a great, great topic. The there's an Orphic work that has not yet, to my knowledge, now it may have in the last couple of years, and I just haven't seen it, but to my knowledge, the Orphic Lithica um has not yet come across as with a translation that you can purchase or pirate. Um, so um Actually, but we Go ahead. I just posted, I just posted that to the Discord. Actually, the only trans it's hard to find, and it's a poetic yeah. translation. Yeah. I doubt it's very literal or accurate, but yeah, there is one. It, better to it's better to, better to read it right straight out. And we'll do this in my Greek class, right? We'll bring up the Lithica. And so, okay, it's the most people translate this as the sacred stones, right? Um, and there's okay, this is okay, this is difficult for me, Rat King. Cause it like, I'm not the smartest guy. So, you know, I'm a cheater. I'm a poker player, right? Who knows how to game the system. So, but I'm just of average intelligence. So I don't quite understand this, but there's an association between the use of the stones and the manifestation or the becoming visible of the deity. So in, for example, um, um, you can talk about that green stone that is placed within the eyes of 
the uh, Syrian divinity. Yeah, the Syrian divinity. Okay, um, she will have the power projected from those stones into your uh, uh, world as you're standing in front of her, right? That power will be, will be reflected to you. And that stone then is considered to hold, it's just like the moon when you're drawing down the moon. So from the stone, you can draw a source. Now, again, that's all analog. And I don't understand what the physics are behind that, but I know they're using these stones in magic practice, within cold practice, right? And it even goes so far as when you kill a dragon in order to remove that stone from its brain, um, that stone is considered to be the source of that dragon's power. And it's referred to as a stone. So I'm thinking what, you know, is that, okay, now are we metaphorically talking about the stone? And that thing in the middle of the head is actually some kind of tissue. But again, it's always referring to it as the stone. And it's in evidentiarily, it's within the context of the performance of rites, right? Mystery rites. So, and each of those stones in the lithica means something, means something. It's like its source of power. So, um, yeah, when you mentioned the stone with the, yeah, with the soul, I hate to use that word soul, but with the psyche, yeah, it is, I told you before, there's pneumatic power within magic, pneumatic power. So Jesus said for a reason, I send my spirit, right? He's, he's calling upon that pneumatic power, rightfully so under the circumstances, there's also a psychic power. And that psychic power, you see it come up a lot in um, more hermetically inclined texts. And how to, and you see it in the, it also in the, on the side of the, oh, it's called the Egyptian Mysteries um, by Iamblichus. Yeah, that psychic, it's like a division of power. It's like a division of power. So what is that stone doing? It's holding that psychic power, right? It's different from the pneumatic power. It's the psychic power, right? And what, what did they mean by that? Because the pneumatic power is from the air, right? We're fighting those powers of the air, says the tra English translation. Those archons of the air, right? Those are pneumatic powers. Whereas when you're dealing with the stone, you're dealing, if it's imsuchos, it has that, that psychic power. So what, what's the actuality of what's going on? I don't know. Do you have your stone and you're doing it and it's giving you, you know, it's putting you in a position? I don't know. If I'm in that temple and I'm looking at that stone, it says it's lighting up the temple and the one that has the eyes of the dragon, it'll be red. And it'll shine that red light. And it's when the initiate opens their eyes and has that red light come into their eyes that they're imbued with that power. So, wow, did you have to be there sucking in all the fumes of the bricks of stuff they're burning on the altar? Yeah, I think you probably had to be there. But, yeah, no, that's central. That's a great question with the magic. That's the best that I could answer that. Anybody else snappy have anything to top off that? Um, I'm not too sure about this one. I, I just get this idea. Like it really reminds me of uh, Shiva does a similar thing where he, where he swallows his own phallus as a stone. And then he's also representative as a stone phallus. So this is the, that imagery is so prevalent um, cross-culturally. And you also see these phalluses in like Harappa in, in the Indus Valley Civ. You see them in Crete, in the Minoan Civ. So there's definitely something about these rocks. And you also see sacrifices being poured and libations poured upon these phalluses, specifically usually offerings of blood or milks infused with psychedelics, especially uh, cannabis and detura in the Indian context. Um, and I, and um, psilocybin mushrooms in the Minoan. 
So we, we know that there's 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 this is going on. So yeah. Yeah. And that alabastrin, that alabastrin specifically, that type of stone is used for the application, you know, of those different drugs. So yeah, somebody asked me about gold the other day. Why are they using gold for like catheters and stuff like that? Um, it's so that your skin, your tissues don't react with it. You know, yeah, it's hypoallergenic, right? Yeah. Is there yeah. something? Is is there something when Dionysus sits on his stone, right? You don't. Um, brides in Rome sit on the stone. They call it the stone priapus, right? Before before the wedding. And you ask, why would you do such a thing? And Augustine hates it. He's like, that's gross. And we can't enter into these pagan. It's too dirty. It's too nasty, right? But um, Dionysus does it. When he comes back from the dead, he sits on the stone. So, And it's a, it's a phallic stone that penetrates him, right? And um, he does it over the grave. Over the grave. So the question is, when Jesus arrests, well, not when he's arrested, he only got arrested once for it, right? But he's doing the same operation according to um, pseudo Clement. He's doing the same operation. And he says it's a mystery that he's teaching this boy. If he's doing that, Bacchic mystery, um, in the remember, he's doing it with the kid that's in the cemetery, right? A lot of people in the secret gospel of Mark, right? A lot of people don't realize that, but it talks about the fact that Jesus was going into the tomb with the boy. The kid's rich and he wants him to stay there because he loves him, right? And Jesus ends up flesh on flesh and it says man flesh with man flesh, right? So does he have his stone dildo at the time? If he's following that Bacchic right, which I think due to the drugs that he's on in the garden, I think um, that's it's likely that he was carrying around an alabastrin with him and he was using it. He might have been using it on the boy, right? He might have been medicating the boy because that's people who don't know that's what you're doing medicating that person, getting them ready for the right, right? And that's why the early Christians are going through that operation where the priest takes it's not a priest, it's a church leader takes in the spirit of the devil right? Takes in the spirit of the devil in order to um, uh, prom, uh, to present the temptation to that boy, to that boy. And, you know, he's naked and oiled, right? And so um, are we doing the blocking thing over and over? You know why it's good? To, according to the um, Christians, the early Christians, why it's good to rape children? I'm not kidding you. It's good to rape pagan children because then they can't be used as oracles because all the oracles have to be non-sexually uh, involved, right? They have to be not. I don't know why if it's for the biochemistry. I don't know. It, you know, it, it doesn't work with somebody who violates that and gets involved sexually. So um, the Christians right. knew that and knew that they said the demons will possess you unless you have already been um, penetrated, right? So um, I don't know. You can save maybe a pagan's life from possession if you um, show them the way, right? Show them the mystery. Like he was that kid. He was just doing this to a kid in a cemetery, right? So, yeah, good stuff. Wow. So Ariel had a, an interesting com, uh, question here. He said, what is sitting on the meta throne if we are talking about sitting upon the throne to draw down the moon? Yeah, sitting on the meta throne. I'm not quite sure. Um, in all my travels, yeah, in all my tra travels, I have not seen the machinery of a meta throne. Okay, I would tell you, Ariel, if I'd found it, um, but I haven't seen it. I'm sorry. So I can't, I, I just can't answer that. Um, I can say though, that sitting on the throne is again, Orphic Vox, Orphic Vox. And we know from Galen's text from Nero's arch physician, we know that throne 
in the Orphic Vox means drug, means drug. And the Victorians, the Victorians figure this out, right? It means drug. So when you are sitting on the throne, you're under the influence of a drug. Yeah. So um, is that how we get you to that place? When we drug you in the right, is that how we put you on the throne? Remember, the tripod is the seat of the oracle. And people don't realize the tripod is just a big bowl. It's a bowl off the ground, right? And you can burn things in it if you want, or you can collect things in it. And so when the oracle does her performance, she does it over that bowl to collect the communion. Yeah. So um, fa fantastic. I mean, um, gorgeous cult stuff going on there. It's, it's amazing. I can't tell you about the Metatron. It's not, I haven't, I haven't come across it. Yeah. To draw I, do, down I have a couple of things to add to that. Uh, depending on the culture, the ritual, I mean, we can see in the PGM, there are these ritual thrones that are sometimes used so that when the person is in a drug state and they're astral projecting, their body is project protected by the symbolism of the throne so that no demons can mess with it while they're astral projecting. The throne is also a microcosm depiction of the heavens itself. Sometimes it might have seven steps or it depicts the cosmology of the heavens and the, the pole star is the highest, the, often the throne, but it, there's also the dais or the platform as the seven heavens behind b below it. So they're creating oh, a pole star. Hang on, hang on. You said something that turned me on. Yeah, the pole, <laughs> right? The poles. When I started studying this stuff and finding the text, I was like, what? What are the poles? And how? Because they're always in there and there's references to them. And right, it's all in the astronomy and everything. It's like jabbed in there, but they're always referred to within specific actions. You know, if you do this incantation, you have to work the pole stars, right? And and not only that, but what are these pole lords? Have you seen the pole lords? Yeah, oh, and they spoke of Moses and stuff. They go into detail about it, and it's very curious. All right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the mechanical. The mechanic stuff. The tent used in the uh, eighth book of Moses is a hot box in a cube shape, which is the, the microcosm of the cosmos as well. So <laughs> it's a hot box. First of all, I'm so glad that you've read the eighth book of Moses. Good for you, right? A lot of people will be scratching their heads, right? Saying, What? There are eight books of Moses. Right? <laughs> yet, no, in antiquity, they knew of eight books of Moses. Yeah, and that eighth is very, very important. And it, don't you think, don't you think, Wretch, that it jibes well? I mean, it meshes well with Solomonic magic. I mean, it just oh, definitely, yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, one thing I want you to, to elaborate on Mon, is this uh, Saturnian magical thing about flipping the poles and this idea of the dote and the antidote in this this revolutionary magic that seems to be at the heart of what's going on within this um, Saturnian mystery. Uh, that's how we get the golden age back, right? R right now, that golden age is confined in hell. The Saturnian way is confined. Switching the poles allows for a natural succession from the oracle of apollo to the oracle of dionysus when that southern pole suddenly becomes the olympian pole where the power is the air right olympus controls the ether um we are submerged in the air the pneumatic right and the underworld breathes this dark this thing that can only be called dark matter right? For lack of a better, when those poles are switched and that ether then is overcome, the Saturnian age returns, right? And we have the return. That's why the, in the book of Revelation, when it talks about the releasing of the dragon in a thousand years, it's talking about that, what the Greeks called the one third time. When that switch 
facilitates the freedom of the one who sits on the throne of the underworld. Satan, Dionysus, Hades, whatever, you know, whatever you want to, you know, call him. It's that ruler of the underworld. So do we have a, do we have magic um, works that show us how to flip the pole? Yeah, we do. It's the, it's the project of bringing back Lady Babylon, right? You have to build that bridge. You have to have that language. You have to build that bridge so that the earth is of one tongue. And when that happens, you know, again, I'm talking in analog. And for your audience who isn't familiar with what I always scream about, um, that Vatican Sybil came along and said, look, you are too stupid to figure any of this out. So what I'm going to do to communicate this to you is I'm going to use analogia. Stick with the analogia. John Littis. John Littis is the one that gives us these sources. Um, this is Vagoya. For those of you who haven't heard of her, probably one of the one of the minds that set human history. Yeah, Vagoya. Vagoya. Thank Etruscan prophetess. Etruscan prophetess. Yeah, Va this is Vatican Hill stuff. Um, um, way before Saint Peter's. <laughs> Right, so this is where they worship Vaticanus. When I was teaching at St. Mary's and we we're doing the Medea, and she invokes Vaticanus, I um, you know, I had to explain to him who this was. Oh, it's a it's a religion that comes from a bunch of women dancing on a hill. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they wow. guide they guide society. Yeah, okay. it's, it's gorgeous. I'm sorry, I'll stop. No, 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 that's awesome. No, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. You always, you always send me into these amazing little. I'm thinking now. So, if I'm understanding this, this, this kind of magic of flipping the poles correctly, then, so the Saturnian force is trying to change time and is trying to progress time forward, and then it seems like this Zeus force is trying to do the opposite, reverse time almost right. bring it back in stagnation and create this mythological past. Like, am I right in, in seeing this almost Manichaean level of infighting that appears between these two forces, this Mars force and the Saturnian force? Is that, is that yeah. a, is that a right view or am I pulling at straws? <laughs> no, no, no. I think, and I think what that does that, you know, they're polar opposites. So we have the, the idea built in of attraction and repulsion, right? And so when you talk about the succession and the freeing Saturn to the return to the golden age, there the Sibyls are constantly saying it, right? Um, and the Christians were called Sibylists before they were called Christians. They're constantly saying this age will return, right? This Saturnian coming back when the lion and the lamb will be, will lay down next to each other. Those images are pre-Christian, right? Jesus is just drawing on those images. I mean, freaking Virgil, right? Was writing Sibylline prophecy, right? So, um, yeah, his, yeah, look at, look at him, the eclogues, right? And the early Christians recognized this, but okay. So what's the, you know, um, what's the deal? Um, the succession is going to happen, right? We know, we know from prophecy, just to put you in their mindset, we know from prophecy that Jove, Jehovah, Jupiter, Zeus is doomed to be overthrown. He's doomed. Just like the, the preceding generations of divinities, right? It's a natural cycle of the universe. There is a switching of poles you know, some kind of correction that takes place when the dragon is free, right? When that red dragon is free to assert that rule, right? So, um, yeah, yeah. There seems to also be like this, this idea going on about this, this corruption effect of, 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 of persisting through time and refusing to enter into a change state, right? Like, like I, uh, am I seen that right in the the early myths of Saturn? Right, he refuses to give up the throne and then becomes the tyrant. At the beginning, he's the hero who overthrows the previous tyrant Uranus, but then by the end, he becomes the tyrant that won't pass on his his power to Zeus. 
right? And now we're seeing Zeus fulfill the same for say, fulfill the same role. And this is almost something you see in history with these ideas as they persist across time, they start to calcify and uh, they need to kind of die and be replaced by something new. Oh, you're on mute. It makes me think, sorry, is that, it makes me think, is that why they walked around with, with a sickle, right? The image, the image that they adopt, that they brand on themselves, that they put in their minds, right? In making their templa, that image is the sickle. That sickle is the harvesting, right? You're cutting off those genitalia. And from that act of succession comes the new generation. Aphrodite comes right out of, you know, we know that she's the queen. She comes right out of that act and that so that's why we're always portrayed with that sickle we are the reapers right we are the reapers for that one third time that reaping has to be re-entered and the god has to be overthrown um again why because we're all part of a death and resurrection cult and not only that we are farmers we understand how nature works, right? We don't have false expectations. We're, we don't have cell phones and computers. We have no social media, right? But what we do have is this incredible natural link to the world. So we think in cycles. When you see the moon, you don't think of a woman's menstruation. Guess what? In antiquity, you do. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it just yeah. makes me think like we have evolution, but it's clear when you read these old texts, they understand through the metaphor of farming that there is this, they don't use those terms, but there is this evolutionary process that's happening. And I think it's understood that there's this idea that as time progresses, we're being alchemicalized so that this flipping can happen so that this, we're constantly in this evolutionary evolving state. Gorgeous. I uh, love it and gorgeous. What you just described is the physics of how that cycle continues, right? I don't, um, I don't pretend to really get it, but I can see through the cycle of the nature. I can see how that makes sense. Yeah, no, it's, it's gorgeous. Now, can you as a, as a bearer, here's the question, as a bearer of the sickle, right? As somebody who can sit on that throne and Jude in the Old Testament, in the New Testament says, he says, um, they're following the way of Cain, these people are, right? And they're, um, that throne of Satan is a central aspect of that, right? They're actually entering. The sickle bearers are actually entering into that return phase, right? So um, supposedly you and I should be able to sit back and read the past, and the future as they exist together with us in the present, right? We should be able to see across time and know that we are at that point where the sickle is applied, right? Where the cycle continues to bring back Lady Babylon and to cause that. Now, what does that mean? Um, 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 uh, Whatever, whatever it means to the evangelicals, right, who hold to the sacred nature of that text, right, it's a bad thing for them because they are part of the um, Jehovah's eth uh, ethereal kingdom, right? And they are looking forward to the return of Lady Babylon because she will herald the apocalypse, right? The final confrontation, right? The final correction. So now that's not part of the original prophecy. The original prophecy is Saturn will reassert, right? And we'll enter the cycle again. It's not, it's not that there will be one conqueror and he will break out of the cycle and everybody will bow to him or die. Right, that's not in the original prophecy. That's something that's unique, not to the New Testament, but to the development of the church, right? And and the, the way it goes, right? No, for sure. um, yeah. 
Yeah, you don't see that present in the myths. Like this, it, it seems very clear that this is a weaponized version of this mythology in order to um, to attack it's to attack these various pagan religions that are existing around them to assert yeah. their dominance. Like yeah. the thing with Christianity that seems so apparent to me is that it's this it's this marriage, right, of pagan universalism and Jewish nationalism, where you're it, it's it's an it's marrying the state and the church in the in the first way in a universal way, like in the in a truly Roman way, right? Yeah, people tend to dwell on the the opposition between the early Christians and the Jews, right? And there's all sorts of conflict between them, but they need each other in a pagan world. They need each other because they, they bounce off each other, right? The, the existence of the Masoretic text is only because of that relationship between Judaism and the church. We need those sacred texts, right? And the Christians are like, yes, um, because I, what we're saying depends upon you. We're not taking your nationalistic approach. We're taking our own faith approach, right? But we need that. They bounce off each other. The pagans didn't need either of them, right? Their rights went back far older. For those of you who don't just know the history, in the Bronze Age, right? The, the, there are no Hebrews, Right, there are no Moseses walking around in the late Bronze Age. By the time we get Moses, the um, pagan practices of the mystery, and you Christians know that your religion is a mystery, the pagan practices for the mystery are already established, right, and functioning. So, by the time we get the oldest Hebrew that we've got, it's not that old. Right, you already have a long established oracular mystery that is using the snakes, that is using all of the imageries that we find in uh, the, the first five books of Moses, you know, with him holding up his staff. You know, you're talking about magic tonight, right? What, um, how did what do you think about that? What do you guys think about Moses and his staff and the type of magic? That he's employing, which you know he learned in Egypt, right? <laughs> right? Well, to me, all of that magic that's going on, like I, I find it interesting that the Egyptians identified the uh, the the Jewish people as worshiping Set, and then if you look at the magic, it's magic of the desert, it's magic of disease, it screams Saturnian to me, right? <laughs> and, and maybe and maybe that's why Tacitus is saying, look, the Jews are originally from Crete. Right. Um, um, and I think was it Cyprus. I can't I can't remember. The, uh, yeah, I think it's Crete. It's all Crete where they worshipped Zeus Amon. Right. <laughs> and there's a battle over which God is going to, you know, you have the Jehovah's and you have the followers of Amon. Right. So um, these are the late Bronze Age. Is, there's migrations all over the place, right? And so when you talk about the Jews coming out of Egypt, that's like, yeah, everybody is migrating, right? So entire, entire ethnicities are moving their locations around, spreading. Um, the Greeks call it colonization, right? And, you know, their later colonization is a little more sophisticated, and they're doing it through the oracles. Right, it's the only way that you can colonize is through the oracles. So, yeah, good stuff. Love it. Love the magic. You know, Moses was doing that stuff. It, you know, there's magic for um, piggybacking on the magic that Moses used. Oh wow! Yeah, you can you you can um, um, use the imagery. <laughs> in the same way to achieve the same effects. You were talking about dreams and the visions, you know, and where those are coming from. Um, just think for a minute. There are groups of people from antiquity who talk about manipulating somebody's dream. I can cast my image into another person's dream. Yeah, I don't know what the physics are, but the way it's represented, they, they actually have a, there's a phrase that's used in Homeric Greek, to stand over the head, right? To stand over the head. In magic, you can stand on the letter, on the letter. You can stand on the sigil. 
You can stand on the image, right? That you're casting, wow. right? And it when you put yourself into the right mosaic position, you can enter into somebody's dream. You can stand on the head, right? So imagine there's, I mean, we don't even think about this, right? Because we assume in our society, you can't influence somebody's dream. It's electric. It's electric. You know, I, I had a ton of neuroscience too, right? And it's, you know, it's, they still can't describe it. What is it? Well, it's the interaction of, you know, neurons and all these, you know, the axon at the synapse and it's the transfer of the chemical there. Somehow you get, nah, whatever. Keep studying, right. nerd boy. Right? Well, there's something, there's something wild about the dreams because the 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 oldest cultures like our aborigines from australia right which are some of the first groups out of africa they have shared dream experiences and they connect them to the ancient past and we see the shared dream across all of these so-called for lack of a better term primitive cultures and then like i think about in my own conception like how i got involved in magic and the real catalyst for me was precognitive dreaming where I would have these dreams that would then become reality. And they'd always be mundane things, but it happens so frequently without explanation. It drove me to, to have to come to these, to find the magic basically. Yeah. See how you're, see how you're sitting in that position when you're having a vision and that vision is of the future. You're now drawing in the present. You're, you're reaching out to both sides of the timeline. You're, your um, and Kronos is that line, right? So you're you're entering that chronic or that Saturnian state, in able to in order to revive that oracle, and you're seeing the future, right? There's spells for this, right? There's spells. There's ways to get there, and then say so. Like a person like you says, wait a minute, I can do this. Have you ever tried to manipulate that now? Have you ever tried to use that so that? Um, you can call up specific bits of the future or are you just passively engaging in it? So I haven't been able to engage in specific bits of the future, but I have been able to lucid dream, right? But what I find when I get to lucid dreaming, which is really weird, is that sometimes the figures in my dream will recognize me as lucid dreaming and prevent me. <laughs> and, and I don't know what the hell is going on with that. But like, no, no, no listen, one listen, of the dreams stop there. that freaks me out. So stop there, stop there, because that's in the PGM. Um, there is a formula, there's several for inducing a dream. And it says in the formula, it says you will be approached by the pole lords and by there's another group. And when you are, don't be afraid. Right, they will recognize what you are doing, and then it gives you a remedy for that to then be able to turn it around and command them. Right, so somebody along the way recognized exactly what you're talking about. That in this lucid dreaming state, all of a sudden people around you can turn, right, can turn and recognize um, uh, uh, what you're doing, what you're trying to do. But there's remedies for that. And I know that there's a name. There was a particular name that was used for that to block that um, recognition. It's almost like if you're going to fly, you've got to fly invisible to the other forces. Right. You, so, yeah, it's yeah, that's so cool. That's so right. cool. It also makes me think of like the Buddha in, the, in like the, the Hindu Tantra because they always talk about how you have to die before you can fly. And that it's something about entering the death state and there's this prevention that the ego your your will not let you. It'll it'll fight you and won't let you leave your body until you can willingly enter a death state. <laughs> You're muted. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, again, physics of the cosmos, your death and resurrection is all a part of that process. Yeah, how else can you fly? When they talk about the medieval witches going to that zone, I told you there are chambers and there's an island. They would say there's an island that you could go to. And supposedly Arthur went there, right? But there's an island where you go where the witches have their um, banquet, right? It's a Sabbat banquet. And in that banquet, it's funny, the food is notoriously bad, right? It's repulsive. 
but it is there that they will bring other people, right? Forcibly bring other people. And um, those people will recognize that the witches recognize that they are not, that they have been brought, right? It's a really, it's a really weird um, description of exactly what that vision inducing state is. But you can't get to that island. You can't fly there until you have been through that process of going to hell and then coming back. Yeah, you have to be in that death, that death first before the devil will give you his wings. Yeah, I don't, what does that mean? Oh man, I wish I, all I know is I want to go to that island. Like or I'm, I'm desperate right, to get an invitation to that island because I want to see what that is. If if Merlin can take Arthur there, that's the story. He's mm -hmm. taking Arthur there so that the queen, who is presented just like the Medwa, so that she can heal him. And he's actually dying in the process, and she brings him back. Right? People, people don't realize that Cersei actually killed Odysseus, right? They don't know that part of the myth. But she actually kills him and brings him back to life. In the process, oh, yeah. It, I mean, come on, you I know. Didn't realize, uh, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. You know, it's it's Odysseus is the original mage, right? <laughs> yeah, no. Mage. He's out in the beginning looking for the arrow poison. He knows what he needs to get that high from the very beginning, mm -hmm. right? And he's the mage in. I mean, his life is the journey of the mage, and um, people don't realize it, but the Byzantine mm -hmm. commentators who made a huge deal out of that myth. They tried to explain what it meant, right? And what that death was for him. So yeah, it's it's wow. uh it's no, that's, uh that's powerful stuff. So I do want to kind of wind down here just because you've yeah. had a re really long day and you told me about that. Um Wretch, do you have any other questions you want to ask before I get to my final question? Well, uh yeah, there's something kind of obscure that I've found coming up here and there. And I and I am curious what you think, Amon. Have you ever come across magnets? Like especially when we were talking about flipping the pole, it brings to mind magnets keep coming up in certain obscure places. There's elaborate theories about like from Democritus and Empedocles and stuff. And it, it seems like this must be playing into it somehow. What these stones, hematite was often used as a for making an amulet or whatever. So uh I just keep coming across this in very pl various places. Yeah, yeah. And you see the magnets in plenty, I think it was, who was talking about it. And what is the, you know, he's the naturalist trying to look at it and figure it out. Um, yeah, I don't, unfortunately, I don't, um, yeah, I don't have anything that you can take home. Yeah, they're there. Are they involved in cult? Is that where you're going? Uh, I can only say I've seen them, but I haven't. And I've seen the property discussed, that property of attraction. I've seen that discussed with, yeah. with reference to what you and I call magnets. But I don't see, um, yeah, somebody needs to research it and find all the sources where yeah. those magnets are being used. Yeah, I can't say more than that. It hasn't stuck out there, to me in my, in my research. I'm sorry. It comes up in some Gnostic stuff, and and you kind of have to, they say, attract the the no, the wisdom in a way that uh, like a magnet attracts uh, iron there. So you kind of have to put your put yourself uh, with the right harmonic charge or something to draw in that energy towards you. It seems, but uh, yeah, because that's everything in the binding. And there's numerous words for, words for binding, but everything in the binding um, takes into account that power of attraction. You have to have that, right? There has to be some um, perfect symmetry going on between you and that thing that you're binding, right? In order to create that attractive, and that's why it's why the incubi are so easy. What's the magnet for the incubi? What is that attractive force? It's the generative, the generative force of intercourse, right? Um, that draws, that draws that incubus, that draws that. They call it the, 
the seed of fire, right? The seed, right. The, the seed of fire. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Ariel has one quick question here that he really wanted to ask. It says, has Amon found any connection between cannabis and alabastron? Because the word is the same in Semitic, at least in Hebrew. And the word is shesh in the Hebrew. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's an um, excellent question between cannabis. I'm thinking now through through the references that I've um, that come. No, I haven't seen a connection with the alabastron. And the only thing that I can guess is from the Greek perspective and linguistically, it's not related, right? Um, so the only thing, yeah, I don't want to guess. I don't want to guess, Ariel. It's a great question and somebody needs to look up and see if there's an association. But typically the alabastron is used for topical application and for the storing of perfumes. And I wouldn't, um, I don't, I can't remember a single example of, oh, uh, hang on. Is there a, I'm trying to think now, is there, are there any cannabis in the, in the oils? Uh, Dioscorides. I'm going to have to go look at some, some Dioscorides again, but I can't off the top of my head. Remember any time where cannabis is associated with the alabastron and I'm coming at it, Ariel, from the perspective of somebody who's looking at it from a medical standpoint. So when I see the alabastron being used medically, that medical dildo, I haven't seen the cannabis there yet. I'm not saying it's not there, right? I'm just saying, look, I don't, I don't, I can't come up with a, a good bit of evidence for that. No. Now I'm interested though, and I'm going to go back and I'm going to look and see if we can find it. Yeah. Good question. Beautiful question. Awesome. So my final question was uh, posed at the very beginning by Rob. And he wanted you, he said that you had mentioned an experience you had in Delphi and he wanted you to elaborate upon that. And then after that, we'll call it, we'll call it a night. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not sure if he's, I'm not sure if he's um, re referencing what I'm going to tell you, but in getting there, I was almost killed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, the roads are terrible as you know, in Greece and we were way up in the mountains and um, I came just probably two feet. It was maybe two or three feet from the edge of a cliff and cracked up. I had an auto accident right <laughs> on, on the top of that uh, a mountain. Um, so for me to be able to go into the experience of Delphi was quite, I was happy to be alive. Yeah, I was really happy to be alive. Um, I don't know if that's what he's referencing there. Um, I will say, though, once you're there um, at the site, you really understand for the first time, and this struck me when I was there, you really understand for the first time what modern-day hippies and scientists in the psychedelic um, drug you know, uh, movement you know, for medicine, what they talk about when they say context. Context, yeah. That surrounding and that area, the way that – the way that the buildings are built into um, their surroundings is purposefully done. And um, uh, I, that's, that's what I would say. But yeah, I almost died. Rob, if, that, if you're not talking about me almost dying, um, <laughs> yeah, let me know. Maybe no, he was referencing else. the almost dying. He wanted to know about if you had to enter like a death and resurrection experience and if that affected your perception at Delphi or if you had any, you know, if there's anything to that. Yeah, no, that, that put me in a state of having soiled my britches, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the person, it's funny because the person I was traveling with, great guy, right? He's a retired school administrator and he wanted me to take him around Greece and parts of Turkey for like 60 days, just showing him sites and just giving him the tour. And um, we both had a moment there. Um, but I, that my car accident, which almost resulted in our plunging over crevasse, wow. um, that, that was payback for what he did when he was in Turkey. And it, he, was at a gas, he was at a gas pump. I was in the driver's side of the car and he was arguing with the people. And you're not supposed to do that, right? If there's a little extra charge on the gas, just pay it, right? Just pay it and shut up. 
right? He didn't know. He didn't know that's protocol. So he started arguing and he took one of the dollar, one of their currency and he ripped it in front of him. Now he, he didn't know that that's a crime against Ataturk at the time. It was a crime against Ataturk. Right. Yeah, no, to deface that bill was a crime. And so I, he comes out, I'm watching this argument going on. And the first thing I think is, okay, I'm going to die now at the hands of a bunch of angry Turks because of this American. I'm really upset. I'm like, he just, he, what's going on? And they come running out. I'm watching it. So I jump out of the passenger side. I jump into the, into the driver's seat. He comes running out, jumps in the passenger seat, and we take off. We take off as fast as we can. And so that's what, you know, I felt like things were balanced out at Delphi, right? That he got what was coming. He needed to be scared <laughs> to the point of death. I just realized at the, a, after the incident, I said, okay, I'm going back and I'm talking to those prostitutes, right? There, there are some great prostitutes in, in uh, Turkey, right? And um, where I was at the time. And I love talking to them. And um, I don't know, it's just the thing of mine. But when I, when I got into that position where I wanted to, where I realized, ooh, that was a close encounter with death, right? The first thing I wanted to do was, I wanted to go talk to those prostitutes again. And I wanted to, I wanted to see what life was. I know why Jesus was hanging out with prostitutes. I do. It's, be, it's because there is something, people don't see it, but there is something cosmically um, majestic, cosmically beautiful about prostitution. There is something about it. And depending on how, how your society regulates it and promotes prostitutes, if those are visitor, if those are priestesses of Aphrodite, um, they're, they're, that's um, a college, a college right. of, right, right? So there's something gravitational. No, there, yeah, you see this in a lot of these classical societies. They have a very different view of women. Like I always think about like uh, in uh, Babylon in summer where they would have these women who were, you know, had men who just paid them to be, you know, and they lived rich, independent, powerful lives. And it's like, uh, this was seen as a norm thing. And these women held almost these priestly positions of power and respect. And uh, you see some parallels to this in our modern day. And I think we'll eventually get there. But yeah, like, w why not allow people to do this? <laughs> right. And Solomon got it when Queen of Sheba came to him, right? He was right in that because, you know, she, what she brought him were all the drugs, right? So, and not only that, but your Hetairai in Greece, the, you think, uh, you know, you, you mentioned names like Pythagoras and Socrates, and you think these are the man-dominated patriarchy. No, no, no. You got to realize behind these men are, are, are always, there's always some priestess, some poetess, some mathematician behind these men who is pushing forward you know the 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 dude who's compelling the dude right i don't know why the dude can't get his own stuff done right <laughs> but you know they recognized it awesome. yeah and that's why socrates remember you only know socrates because the delphic oracle said this man this man is the wisest man in athens and when that news hit out, wait, what? She said, what? She said, Socrates? Everybody's running Socrates. Whoa, what's going on, right? You see the feminine respect, that feminine authority. Yeah. It's, well, it's, I was going to bring that up. Like the whole Greek world at that time revolves around the Oracle of Delphi. Whatever she says, in, it, it, it dictates how all of these nation states react. And like we have such a mis misconception about this. Like I always think about Sparta. Thing that sticks out to me about Sparta is all the women were the landholders and held all the political power, right? Like, why does no one talk about that? <laughs> you know? Yeah, and yeah, and they walked around like they wanted to walk around. And if their the exposed breasts bothered you, you could suck it, right? That's all there is to it, right? So when when Mary Beard comes out from Cambridge and says women were submissive, they entered their homes, they didn't come out of their homes, you're missing a huge you know i don't know it's just i don't know it, it makes me angry i wish the feminists would um see the real world that existed in antiquity because they wouldn't be so they wouldn't be talking about oppression 
right? Um, nobody oppressed Medea, right? Nobody oppressed Medea. They tried and she ended up killing people. She ended right. up refounding an empire, right? In, in, in modern, in the, the Medio Persian movement, right? Mm -hmm. She's the one who started that. So, I always thought it was like, like in, with Medea, especially even in like Seneca and Euripides, where you get these tales of extreme violence from her, she gets away with it. it right. It's also implicitly understood like this is re, re, a retributive justice, right? Yeah. For the violence right. of men. Why does she right. kill her sons? They're right. representative of the patriarchy, right? right. Like, and, 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 you know, there's an argument, the Corinthians, um, somebody, an ancient historian, a Greek guy, you know, so take it for what it is but said that um, at the time that she supposedly reportedly killed her children, because that's what was reported. And the Corinthians said, um, um, this is bad, right? Um, this woman is bad. We're going to get her. And yeah, she killed her children. Well, a later Greek historian says, no, that's not what happened. And we know it's not what happened because we know the Corinthians killed them. Because it was like a decade later when they had a plague, Corinth had a plague and they asked the Oracle, they said, what's wrong with this plague? And she said, you have killed the children of Medea and blamed it on her. And that's why you have a plague. So until you build a monument to them, you're still going to get a plague. You're going to have a plague the whole time. Right? So what did they do? They built a monument. We know where that monument is. So, you know, it's at the place that they slaughtered them. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't see her buckling. She went back and made an empire that kicked ass. You know what I mean? No, yeah, you're 100% no, you're you're, you're right. And we have all these Amazon warrior women, right? We have all, like, of course, you're going to have women who are oppressed in the ancient times. Like, there's extreme violence and slavery and all of this. Yeah. But to dismiss an entire sex one half yeah. of the population, it's 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 absurd. It's beyond yeah. absurd. And then you have to take context. You're dealing with how many thousand years of history, how many nation states. Like people have this amalgamated view of Greece. And it's just yeah. weird that Mary Berry, who's such a great expert on so much, would just yeah. have such a whitewashed opinion. Yeah, just, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's yeah. wild. Yeah. And that's why I'm glad to be Ronan, because being Ronan allows me to throw that stuff in your face, right? You need somebody. You need that fool. It's yeah. that, that King has a fool to tell him, doesn't matter how offensive it is, but to tell him what the reality is. You're the right? accuser, Ramon, right? What's that? <laughs> you made your pact. You're the accuser. Yeah. You right, right, right. Accountable. <laughs> right. And what is the blasphemy that we're bringing? The blasphemy is your, your Jesus was arrested in a public park with a naked boy. You've been right. worshiping a pedophile, right? Yeah. Imagine if you can tell, if you can communicate that to people. If you could go into the largest um, cathedral and just announce, hey, we just found out Jesus was arrested in a public park with a naked boy. You know, just that information is so damaging, you know, but it's the reality, right? I'm not making that up. People can go no. look it up. But, you know, right. apologetics, like, how do we deal with all these apologetics? Like, the one that I keep coming across now is like, oh, the boy was just Jesus's lover in the book of John. And it's just the beloved disciple. And there's nothing going on here. They were wearing those kind of clothes. It's normal for a rap to just fall the fuck off. And they weren't in a cemetery. What are you talking about? There's no cemetery. Where's the semen? What do you mean there's semen? You know, Nonus? Nonus is so late. Secret Mark? What are you talking about? Who the hell is Houston Smith, right? Like you yeah, get Right, on right, right, right. <laughs> Morton. Yes, Morton. Yeah, Morton, sorry. Houston Smith was a great, wasn't he like a yeah, great Yeah, he's a, I'm getting him confused because he's also a religious studies guy, you know. Oh, so. that's who that, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 you're right. Yeah. Great, great score. Good for us. Look at our memories. <laughs> they're, they're not very good. It's too much Asterian, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I know that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Gandalf. My my daughter came out the other day, and she was like, "Gandalf was mad." That she's reading the Lord of the Rings. You know what I mean? She's reading the Fellowship, and she said, "Look, Gandalf comes out, and he's mad, and he says he hasn't had his pipe yet, right? <laughs> right? Why does nobody? Why does nobody look at that stuff? Right? It's like right? we don't 
We don't want that. We don't, we want those prostitutes out. We want that, yeah. that movement out. We want that possession gone. Right. Like, right. It's that spirit, sticks it's, with me when I was in India and I'm asking my, prof my professors about the significance of the drugs. They'd, oh, the, the drugs are pointless. It's all yogic practice. The drugs don't do anything. And meanwhile, I could see across the way, these sad who's smoking shit tons of weed <laughs> like from these chilling pipes. And it's like, you're telling me there's nothing. And these guys just do that 24 seven. Like what the fuck? <laughs> You're muted, You're again. muted again. You're still muted, Amon. <laughs> thanks, thanks for thanks for having me on. Um, I yes. just said, oh, those guys over there, um, they they were sitting on the throne of Satan, right? With their right. yeah. So you should give their perspective, right? <laughs> see what see what it is. It this has been so nice. Thank you for. Thank you for inviting me. It the time just flew like that. I mean, right. I should be exhausted right now, but, but this has been invigorating. I hope, I hope your audience appreciates um what you're bringing them. Do they? You got a good audience who appreciates? Oh you? yeah, oh yeah. A lot of them are from the Discord, so they're all people engaged with this who are interested in in, in and are looking for this contact content. And this is why, like, I'm so happy we can have this conversation with you because, like I said, so many people in your position hide this and are afraid to talk about it you know yeah. but it's clear to me that they're 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 if you're engaged in this high level of academia you can't but not somewhat engage with the magic you know yeah that's a dangerous walk right because you know as soon as you do and they hear it you know it's going to be a problem but isn't that part of the fun i mean come on yeah um snappy i got to stand i got to put medea on a stage at a Catholic university. I got a chorus of furies. They're pointing dildos at the priests saying, look at your hypocrisy. Look, look what you were doing. Amazing. And at the time, at the time they were battling legal battles with children that had been involved, you know, with the priests, right? There were things going on. So the, the fact that I was lucky enough to stand in that, in, in that opening in that breach and um, was get, that to me was the most honorable thing I could possibly when that professor stood up and he said, this is incredible, but you're going to get fired. I knew I was like, yeah, that's the working of the, that's how you do the magic, man. That's how you bring it. If you're not burned, uh, if, if you, if you haven't been investigated, um, right. And burned, you know, that in this world you haven't, you haven't really served the muse, you know. Right, what I mean? you're not accusing anything, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Amon, and thank you so much, Wretch. This has been a lot of fun, and I'm sure we'll do it again sometime soon. Thanks, Thanks guys. Make, sure you, make sure you all head over Great to um, uh, Amon's channel, Lady Babylon, where he does regular lectures and regular uh, Wednesday night Bible streams, and he also is on our Discord, Myth and Lore offering uh, Greek lessons to all who are willing to participate for free. This is an opportunity you do not get. So yeah, <laughs> thank yeah. you, Amon, for all of this. And uh, yeah, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Hail Satan. Hail Satan, Hail my Satan. friend. All right. Good night, everyone. And thanks again. If you come over to the Discord, uh, we'll be doing an after talk. So bye for now. Bye-bye.